Right on. What's going on, everybody? Thanks for coming out to, I guess this is the third edition now of our Learning Grow series. This week we're discussing the importance of empathy within DAOs. I think this is going to be a juicy one. Uh, it's a simple one. We all think we got it. Yet I, I think it's something that we all tend to struggle with. Uh, we've got Bubbly here from, from EcoDAO and myself, and we've got Drost here and, and Anthony from Bankless. Uh, I think, uh, and the EcoDAO here, I think Anthony might be, be quiet because um, he's on recording duty. But um, yeah, why don't we kick it off with what has been the biggest empathy blunder anybody on stage has seen since they started uh, blunder i just mean something innocent like what what's the situation that we've come across or someone's come across where i don't know just a comment or miscommunication or something I would say uh, I haven't s off the top of my head. I don't have any big juicy stories, but <laughs> I would say in general, one thing I've noticed is that uh, sometimes people will try to be very direct in what they're saying. And sometimes it can lead to people thinking that a conversation is getting more heightened than it is. I haven't actually seen anything get to a blowout personally. But I have seen a few times where somebody said something very direct and then someone else kind of took that as being rude. And it usually quickly de-escalates where somebody's like, oh, well, I wasn't trying to be harsh about it, just trying to get answers and get it solved. And so I've seen those things to views rather quickly, personally. Oh, man, I feel like you're talking about me. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I remember the early days of, of Bankless Now um, and, and the Get Involved channel, uh, helping people understand the membership requirements and stuff. I'm like, to me, it's pretty simple. You have 35,000 bank or you don't. Like, it, 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 it's black and white. Um, one means you, you have a guest pass and it means you're a member. And I, I, I remember there, it seemed like one in five people I would talk to um, just didn't like how direct I was being and same thing like they, they'd blow up at me so the odd person wouldn't want to deal with me whatsoever we'd send, we'd connect them with another community manager uh, more often than not though uh, it got resolved pretty quick and we actually ended up becoming friends and a lot of those a lot of those people um, we, they work really well together um, it, it was interesting how that worked as well once it played out I'm not sure what everybody else has experienced in, in those areas, probably your or the... I think also in the early days or, or when you join any new organization or group, whether it's especially in these virtual spaces, that it takes time to to figure out the the landscape. Um, you know, what kind of community is it? Can you speak freely? Um, do you need to be more careful in the choice of words? Um, one of the things I first discovered, uh, I've been with Bankless DAO since the beginning. I got into, into Web3 and crypto and blockchain, all that stuff in um, early 2021, although it had been on my radar, kind of in the background for a while. But anyway, first joining Bankless DAO, like a lot of uh, people this round, I mean, I was new to Discord. Um, I really wasn't active in social uh, media communities. I, I don't really care for those. I'm I, without getting into my personality profile. I just I just don't t tend to engage on social media. I usually find it a waste of time, and it just makes you angry at your friends. Um, but anyway, uh, at least that's what's happened over the last decade or so. But getting back to joining joining this space, um, I think people come into it with a different different attitude and approach. But then also, what I found at the very beginning of these was uh, it was a very international audience, um, uh, different cultures, different languages, um, 
all of those components that that come together and you're sitting here in a in a, and sitting here at your computer screen looking at an avatar of somebody you have no idea what their what their background is you have no idea how they're reacting to what you're saying just like right now are you guys rolling your eyes or or are you listening intently i have no idea um and then leaving space for other people to speak um and it's easy to continue to ramble on which i will i will try not to do but getting familiar with those spaces and learning how to communicate leaving space maybe talking a little slower i was doing a lot of listening and lurking early on and as you become more comfortable i've become guilty of this myself as i start talking faster i may be if i'm in a room with people from the same culture or a similar background you tend to i don't know i i at least tended to to talk more and that tends to at least my impression is it it tends to make it more difficult for those that maybe are a little more timid or new to the space maybe have a language barrier or you know or just just more introverted um and i think that can be a challenge so yeah it's 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 a difficult situation with without a lot of signals um so and building trying to have empathy in that in that environment is is a real challenge and and i think we got to give ourselves a break and do our best and and like coach had said when we recognize that we've we've stepped over the line or we've we've made a cultural faux pas or something immediately recognize and say hey i'm sorry i did not mean that the way it sounded um and i think we just need to be have a heightened awareness of that 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 ownership and that accountability definitely like the personal accountability it it definitely goes a long way especially for those listening to this who uh, want to establish themselves in this space and, and make a name for themselves um it, it really goes a long way to hold yourself hold ourselves to a standard uh and not only hold the mirror up to yourself uh, when you make a blunder but give the people around you permission to hold the mirror up to you as well right um because we all have we all have a blind spot whether we like to admit it or not we all have blind spots and sometimes it takes a, a friend of ours or a peer or maybe it's a random community member to hold up the mirror for us to to show us hey like here's there's nothing wrong with what you're thinking it's just you're not coming across the way that you want maybe we can find a middle ground i really like what you said too drost about the the cultural norms and, and that as well um that is huge there's also the other end of the spectrum um which is where i fall into and what i what i struggle with i slow down when i'm comfortable when i'm comfortable when i know what's going on when i'm good with the community um or or comfortable with what i'm doing i slow down i'm very mellow it's and and sometimes it it's boring right as a content creator i've been told i i, I put people to sleep <laughs> when when i fall into that um you can tell when i'm in a new community or an uncomfortable like um a, a, an environment that i'm not familiar with i get very loud i talk very fast you can tell i'm not breathing i'm talking right up the top of my lungs and i just like go like i just go full speed just da 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 and then it's like okay i'm i'm done and I'm out of the spotlight and i'm perfect kid now um yeah it's it's interesting how how we all handle these things a, a little bit differently or sometimes considerably differently i i think your mic's not working bubbly i i can see that you unmuted yourself but i do not hear anything well it's like uh public speaking you know one of the number one fears among humans is public speaking you have dreams about being up in front of a room and having just your underwear on or something or whatever we've all had these horrible dreams and we're expected to 
to get up in front of a group and and then you'll be on a call like this and this one's pretty easy there's only a dozen people in the audience and there's four of us up here on stage but you know i first my first time i spoke like on a bankless community call bankless dow community call and i looked up i shouldn't have looked i looked up there and i saw that there were like i forget what day that was there, it was a big day there were like 300 people in the call <laughs> And I suddenly froze. It's like I suddenly realized I was in a in a in an auditorium filled with three hundred people. And um, and it's weird because it, it that visceral feeling you get the anxiety. So I stood up. I stood up and started using hand gestures to to release the energy, um, and it helped. But uh, yeah, that's that's a weird thing. And. and um, the other thing I've learned is um, I've started doing some podcast hosting things and the amount of non words we use and repeated phrases and rambling. It's really amazing when you go back through the transcript and see the way we speak. And it's like, Oh my goodness, I can't believe I talk that way. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, it's training your brain. And I repeated myself for six. <laughs> Or you're so focused on your materials. I noticed this too. If you know you have a predefined agenda, and you know it's good to have have some areas you want to discuss or some bullet points you want to bring up. But if you stick too close to your agenda, and I found this, I, I was uh, listening to an interview I did, and then there were some other interviews that we've been working with, just learning how to do this stuff. And and you catch the guest saying something that you could really riff on it or ask a good question about to probe some more, and it's a if you're not really listening carefully, if you're not engaging in active listening, it's a huge missed opportunity. And you just you just you hit your head against the wall. It's like, oh man, I missed that. If I had really been listening and not looking at my notes or trying to check my audio levels and all this other stuff. Um, and I think that's the other thing too. We're all our own producers. We're sitting here, we're like an octopus, but with only two hands. You're You're monitoring audio levels. You're trying to keep up in a text chat you're posting links, you're looking at references, um, you're trying to make sure your mic is muted or unmuted, depending on the case. It's a, there's a lot of moving parts. And I think, I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for, for the multitasking that is required for doing that. Absolutely. Uh, Buzz, Navic, I see you got your hands up in the audiences. You want to go ahead and use the, the call chatter um, text right up above here. Drop your questions in there, and uh, we'll definitely answer them. Uh, Bubbly, is your mic sorted? I don't hear yeah, you. I, oh, I'm not yeah, sure if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, you're good. We'll, we'll let you uh, right. have the mic here. For a right. Um, no, I, I was just listening to this discussion on you know empathy about uh, and and it, it's talking about your the way you speak the way you project the way you connect and it, it's kind of an uh, a personal uh personal connect that one makes through these uh smaller cues and and that's what matter because as uh Ross was, uh, was talking about being an international uh workforce that we are and we our, our, the way we speak, because body language is something that can't be seen so much because we have a lot of anonymity. We have a lot of where people don't come on uh, videos, but the other way we speak, the way we, uh, the use of words, all of that becomes extremely crucial, you know, uh, to show how empathetic uh, we are or uh, and how, uh, how, uh, how much we feel about things and uh, in 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 every matter, more so when there are some personal emergencies, exigencies, that one would please be your team member or or your colleague. It it becomes very 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 important. I mean, in my case, recently I had this uh, major uh, crisis that happened where I, my mother was hospitalized, and the kind of support and empathy that I have received from all the DAOs that I have I've been working with. Is it's it's immense. It 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 was insane because uh, from support like say for example with uh, EcoDAO, I got extreme support from everybody. I had 
uh, Derby uh, <clears throat> coming in and helping out there so that, you know, I, I get that kind of support. And that I think that happens only when you're able to connect and those connects happen, uh, you know, when you're working together. So these are, uh, these are the kind of experiences that one would share. I would also like to hear everyone's story out here, but this is my story, recent story where the kind of support I I got from everywhere is it's extremely insane and touching. Yeah, I would back that up. Um, it's it's great that we're even having this conversation because in a more traditional corporate structure, we don't really think about empathy. That's HR's job. It's not everyone's job. So it's kind of, you know, being able to have this discussion and uh, more personally, like when I have like work issues or whatever in, in your corporate job, it's kind of hard to ask for help. And it's a cultural shift within, you know, the DAOs to be able to know like, oh, if I'm frustrated about something, if I'm having some trouble, I can actually just reach out to the people on my team and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. I know it's my responsibility, but I, I need some help. And most, so usually somebody's going to jump in there and help you. And that's just not how we have it in the traditional world right now. And the same thing with like you're saying about emergencies. I also had you know, a big emergency last month, and it really made me drop the ball on a lot of things. And everyone backed me up and and uh, supported me where they could and just gave me the space to like, delay things that were able to be delayed. And just having that, you know, simultaneously having the Dow support me while my real life job was weighing more heavily on me throughout the same tragedy is a very different shift. I mean, that, that empathy is what made me make the decision to leave my day job. Cause it was like, you know what, I'm a healthier person in the Dow space and I'm able to actually contribute, uh, as who I am and not who the world wants me to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are, those are powerful shares and you definitely don't get that it, in the, in the default world. It's, it's really cool even like opportunities to learn though right like i i think i talk to i talk to people almost daily uh who are wanting to get started in DAOs and stuff and some of them it is very easy to draw clear lines between their skills and stuff and to to somewhere to plug them in other people and and i definitely in this category it's myself it, it's not so hard to place people sometimes sometimes people need to learn a whole new set of skills or sometimes a new way of being um there's so many different things to learn to get plugged in and even for somebody coming in fresh with um, regardless like with looking at only one variable and, and the variable of like do i have the skills to to work here uh, if the answer is no, if like it, it is relatively simple. It is simple, not necessarily easy, to find something that you're passionate about and interested in, and dive in, learn learn new skills, meet new people, and being able to being able to show up with that level of humility and say like. I don't know where to put myself, but you know, I'm, I'm committed. I'm, I'm ready to learn. Like, can I, can I plug in? Can someone show me the ropes? Uh, quite often, like in my mind, in my opinion, like that's an internship. Like, and depending on the DAO that you're working in, um, sometimes they might compensate for that. So you're getting a paid internship, which that doesn't really happen in, in the traditional world, in the default world either uh, it, it's really amazing and to see that level of support and encouragement and and empathy as well right where it's like personal situation great like you're here the team's got you we're good um <clears throat> needing needing to go down a different path to change the pace whatever 
it's the same thing. Like it, it, if people can see that you've got the initiative, um, they'll be more than happy to help you to help us learn the ropes on whatever we need to get where we're going. Hey, uh, coach, I see that there's a couple of hands up and then there's also a couple of comments in the chatter. Do you mind if I read off one of the chatter comments here? I think it's a yeah, good one. yeah. I saw the hands up there. I asked them to drop their, their questions in the call. Yeah. So Buzzman says, when you're dealing with people from diverse cultural backgrounds, how do you create an arena of understanding across teams of pseudonymity and fluid contribution? That's a very good question. And I, I'm here pondering myself as we're, as we're discussing these things. It's... Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a really good one to, to, um, to key in on. And then Grandma Judith has really, I think, a related conversation. How do you foster empathy and open conversation in your DAOs and communities? And yeah, that, I mean, I wonder, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking here in just a moment. I, you know, we have had some challenges, you know, with, with misunderstandings and, and people may, take the wrong conclusion from something and how do you, how do you nip that? How do you address it right away? And how do you keep, I'm, you know, trying to talk about these things in generalities without, without referring to specific situations, you know, you can have these, have a personality conflict. And if those bubble up into unrelated conversations or meetings, you find, I mean, I've seen this happen and I, I'm not going to mention names and I'm not going to mention communities, but I've seen this happen where a private personality conflict will bubble up into a totally unrelated conversation. And there'll be, you'll see maybe a snarky comment or maybe it may even end up on a Twitter post as a kind of a passive aggressive way of, of not actually dealing with the personality conflict. And, you know, I, I can see that you're heading down a very toxic path. Um, so anyway, I just, I, I'm just looking at it, that, that side of it too. You know, we talk about all the kumbaya and all the, you know, the empathy, but there, there are some, some issues and, and how do you address that where you've got something going on in the community or, or communities that there's some bleed over, there's some overlap. And I think a lot of us are in, in multiple DAOs or we're all exploring these web three spaces. And then you run into the same person there. And if you haven't resolved that conflict in, at the source and you're letting it spill out over into other DAOs, other communities, real, in real life events, I mean, I, we're all we're going to do is replicate the toxicity of web two. <laughs> and, and that's a concern. Uh, quite frankly, mine as well. Yeah, so for that, what I tend to do is I fall back on the time-tested and proven strategies that work. And, and I tend to draw um, a little bit from, from military history, and I draw a lot from uh, leadership development and those types of programs. And like it, it, the, the age old system for creating that alignment is the mission, vision and value, right? Um, the ancient Spartans, they had their ethos, they had their version of it. The Vikings had it, um, not just warriors, but I mean, modern day businesses, uh, sports teams, they all have some sort of an ethos or mission, vision and value. And that's, that's the alignment and the synergy. That, that's what creates the synergy and the alignment. Now, yes, there's a lot of nuances. There's cultural, linguistical. Uh, there, there's a lot of nuances that go into it. And that really comes down to the creators and the future leaders. Right, the creators or, or the, the original, the founding leadership team, it's up to them to provide the coaching and the support to the community to yield the results that they want to result, um, 
a, a good example of that, a prime example of that, it happened last year, is during a community call, um, an Italian member or somebody was up on the stage that had an accent, and and somebody tried to say that they liked the person's accent, uh, but the way that they said it in the chat came across like it, it, it was 50-50. Are you making fun of the person or are you complimenting them? Um, and that, like, just stepping in with mild coaching and saying, like, you know, I think this is what you're trying to say. I don't think you realize, I'm not sure you realize that you came across this way. Can I suggest maybe phrasing what you wanted to say a little bit more like this or use more appropriate emojis or whatever the case may be? Uh, people really, really respond well to that. And even then, you can just like what really works well is even just um, a list of, of core values or a list of, of principles, right? Um, one of my one of my favorite books, um, "Staring Down the Wolf," um, Mark Devine. It's uh, seven leadership commitments that forge elite teams. The the commitments that he talks about in this book are courage, trust, respect, growth, excellence, resiliency, and alignment in that exact order. If we as an individual do not have the courage to take the required action, to have the required conversations to do our jobs, it's very hard to build trust within our teams. And trust is a two-way street, right? Without building that trust within the team, there is no respect like it, it's just it's just human nature it is very hard for us to respect someone or something that we don't trust so we need courage to build trust we need trust to build respect we need the respect of our community or our team in order to foster the environment for us to grow as we're growing the expectation is excellence that ties into that personal ownership and that personal accountability we talked about a little bit earlier. Once we're all striving for excellence, that builds resiliency. Because, and we've been, we, like, we, we've shared a ton of stories, both Bubbly and Anthony shared powerful stories on resiliency. Like, when, when you've got a team member that needs help, like, um, like those two, um, in, in their examples, when they come back and rejoin the team and, and they're better positions, how much more resilient are they as team members, as community members, are they going to be? How much more resilient is the team going to be after having gone through that and figured out how to rally that support and complete those objectives? Which leads to the seventh principle of alignment, right? It's, it's very hard to be in alignment with each other if we're not resilient both as, as a team and an individual and i think I think as simple as it is that is a very effective way of um addressing all those concerns it doesn't have to be complicated from there it's just a matter of providing the coaching and support to make sure that everybody has the same comprehension of, of what we're trying to articulate Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I would also say that, um, and some, there's some chat uh, saying this as well, is that it is a, a lot of self-awareness and personal responsibility. I was listening to a podcast over the weekend where they were talking about DAOs and saying that um, if there's a conflict, it is on the people in the conflict to have a conversation and try to solve that thing. Obviously, not everyone is going to want to do that. So then when it doesn't get solved between the original two, someone else needs to take that uh, initiative to step up and say, hey, I want to help heal this, you know, at least get past this point. If you two can't get along, let's at least move to a point where um, you can work away from each other or whatever it may be. So it does it should be on the initial people to solve problems themselves because in this space personal responsibility and reputation are very important 
So you really want to put out any fires. And if you don't want to work with a person after that point and you don't have to, then that's, you know, that's fine. You don't have to, but you should still put out fires and make sure that everything's good. And uh, so, yeah, it it is a lot of self-awareness and all of the things you said, coach, are are very personal in a way because a leader can create the environment for all of those things. And that's kind of what you're describing is what a leader would do to create the environment for the team to thrive. But it really takes the team feeling comfortable and feeling that empathy to really truly adopt those values. And I think a lot of it does begin, like you said, with mission, vision, values, where sometimes maybe the reason conflicts are happening is because someone on the team doesn't actually align as much as they may think they do. And that's okay because they'll find their place, you know, whether it's there or not, they'll find another DAO that does maybe better suit their needs. Or even a different team within the same DAO. I mean, um, I think we need to give ourselves space to experiment and to to jump into a team or work group whose work sounds interesting and, and are things you you personally resonate with and acknowledge going into it saying, look, I don't know much about this subject, but what I can bring to the table are these other skills that I have in my IRL job or whatever. And it's like, this is how I can tr- con- contribute now until... I learn the other components. And you know what? It may turn out that that team you're working on or that project group turns out to not to be that interesting to you. Or like uh, Anthony had said, you know, maybe you just don't vibe with that group. And that's okay. You know, we aren't, we don't necessarily, you know, we all have to get along in the world to avoid war and conflict. But you don't necessarily have to hang out with the same people or you know, if you don't enjoy or if you don't really vibe with a particular group, there's no rule that says you have to stay it there. And that's, and, and it doesn't, it's nothing bad on you or bad on the other person or bad on the other group. It's just, maybe it's not what you're interested in, or maybe, maybe their set of core values or their, their core deliverables that they're working on, whatever it is, aren't really what you're interested in. Well, and if, and if you don't get excited about it, maybe you should be working on that. And I think we just all needed to be more honest with ourselves and each other and say, look, you know what? I'm just not vibing with this and I will complete what I promised to do, but I think I'm going to shift gears next time around. And there's no harm in that. I think we just need to give ourselves more space for it and and not, you know, maybe you're, you're not. There's a, and the range of skills too, you know, we come at it from years of corporate experience versus somebody just out of college versus somebody who's never been in that kind of an academic or corporate environment and is just trying to find their way and not, not be stuck in a, in a dead end job. I mean, the range of experience and, and all of that and what you bring to the table and you don't know where everybody falls into it until you've worked together a little bit. I think we are in an invite. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. I have mm-hmm. to keep asking yeah. this. Yeah. Sure. We are in an environment where we, you know, agree to disagree sometimes, but that disagreement, if it is with respect, with empathy, uh, acknowledging that, you know, uh, we are in an environment where not everybody is going to agree with what we say, but um uh, also disagreements or not agreeing to somebody's point of view and and listening to what it is creates an environment where you're you're you're, you're creating an environment where uh, people are able to open up speak and uh, also uh, challenge things i th- i think that also creates an empathetic and uh, a respectable environment for people to thrive Yeah, that really goes a long way. Uh, I do actually have a really great example of that. If somebody, if anybody out there there needs an example of that, but um, 
that myself and Koros are a great example of that. Um, he, he's an awesome guy. I, I like working with them. Uh, back in the early days of, of Bankless, Koros is one of those people that I used to butt heads with a lot. Um, and we had a lot of conversations, both publicly and, and privately, trying to understand each other. Um, we, we started making progress once um, we put it in the framing of, like, I personally, I have a very, like, Spartan attitude. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I tend to take the, the proactive, not reactive. I'm like, if I can get ahead of something, I want to be ahead of it. Um, and just get it done and, and keep it behind me so I don't got to worry about it. Um, and and David is very much, um, Koros is very much the like the Athenian mentality, right? The democratic, let, let's sit back, let, let's talk and, and have an in-depth conversation about it before, before we start going down too far down any trails. And like it, it, it took almost... It, it, it took a very long time for, for Koros and I to, to learn how to work with each other and and overcome that. Um, it, it, it got to a point where eventually, just up for a while, um, we have totally different interests in the space, so we didn't see each other for a little bit. Um, but then when he hopped over here to be co-lead on the team with me, um, it was really cool, too, just to see how much growth we had both had in the... In, in the few months that we hadn't really seen each other because we were busy in different projects and stuff. Um, and, and we work really, really well together. So yeah, like empathy and have like, just having the humility to have those conversations. And like, we bluntly said to each I remember a conversation clear as day where him and I just bluntly said to each other, like, I don't understand you whatsoever. <laughs> like, I I just don't understand like what, what's going on here, um, and that stuff is gonna happen, and and it's very true. Like we only have our reputations. Um, we're just a random PFP person, whatever behind a computer. Like who knows? Maybe it's a bot. Um, having that be having that humility to have those conversations with people, whether it's publicly or privately, and and come to that level of understanding, uh, making it through those learning bumps to the other side, at least in my example, like we've become a pretty powerful team. That if we didn't give each other that that chance and we didn't take that time to to talk to each other, get to know each other, try and understand each other and and try and like figure out what each other's mindsets were. Um, and, and each other's worldviews on things like we we wouldn't have even had the chance to be able to work together like this. Um, and that's something I'm both grateful for, like very grateful for that. And I think it's also like a, a very beautiful story. Um, and it does kind of tie up a lot of what we Yeah, the, the phrase that comes to my mind out of that is, I mean, communication styles. I think back to um, assessment things I had to take in, in the corporate world in the U.S. And one of those was the Myers-Briggs, um, I forget what it is, personal inventory or whatever it's called. I don't know if that's used internationally or if it's more of a U.S.-based Western thing. But um, it basically takes a look at personality styles, whether you tend to be more data oriented or more people oriented, empathetic versus, or I forget what the INF, I forget all what all the, there, there's these four different categories. But the point being that when, let's say a salesperson is communicating with a, with a developer, um, <laughs> and this is obviously, I don't want to paint a stereotype, but, but, you know, that, that the personality type that is drawn toward those two different types of work also communicate differently. And so where you might, a salesperson, not, maybe not a salesperson, but someone who is more intuitive feeling, likes to talk through things versus someone who's more engineering oriented, the engineer typically, and again, don't want to do broad brush strokes, but just wants the facts, you know, give me the data. What do we need to do? Give me the, give me the structure and let's move on. I'm done. 
And then the, the other personality type wants to talk through things, may not necessarily have all our data in front of them, doesn't have a concise thing, wants to, wants to have a big conversation about it. And it drives the other person nuts because all they want to do is get to the point and move on. And I think, and that's one example. And then you combine these permutations of the different personality types uh, and then combining those people. And you've got, I, forget, I can't do the map on it off the top of my head, but you've got a lot of permutations there of personality type and communication style. And leaving space to explore that, ask questions, that that repeat your understanding of what somebody has said or ask questions for clarification i think can help that because then that gives you the opportunity to say look that's not what i meant or if you're somebody who tends to talk more like i do you go into a meeting with somebody and say look how are we on time today i wanted to get to the you know, these are the things i came to talk about today and where are you at and just just setting that up right up front so you don't go off on a big ramble like I'm doing right now uh, before before you get to the point. And I think sometimes that's that's a way to, but you don't know it until you've worked with somebody a while or you know a little bit about them. So um, there can be a lot of false starts. Yeah, that's one I catch myself in quite a bit. Um, I've been paying more attention to that over the last couple of weeks for myself um, because I wanted to have some examples of, of things for, for when this is coming up. But I, I've noticed I, I fall into that too. I mean, I'm human. Uh, someone will, like, maybe something will happen in one community and someone does wrong and they get kicked out and find myself questioning if I can than another community that I'm working in, um, or you know, somebody's somebody's consistently missing deadlines or or something, and um, you, you start thinking like maybe they don't they don't want to be involved, maybe they don't like me, maybe they don't whatever, um, and then you talk to them and you just find out that that it's not any of those things. They just actually have a lot going on, and for whatever reason, they didn't feel comfortable asking for help or, or support. And then you really feel like a piece of garbage for coming to, to those conclusions in your head. But at the same time, you're, you're definitely thankful that you, that you took the time to sit down and, and have a chat with those people because you get that understanding, you can find that path forward and it, it just saves everybody so much, <laughs> so much. Yeah, I mean, we're all looking for shortcuts, and, uh, and I shouldn't say shortcuts. I, that implies um, not doing well, yeah, not doing the diligence on things. But uh, whether it's listening to YouTube uh, podcasts or YouTube shows at double speed to get through it, or 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 multitasking or skimming things to, to try and get to the gist of it, so you can move on. I think we tend to take those shortcuts in personal human interaction as well. And you make assumptions based on prior, maybe some prior data sets in your own mind. It's like, oh, I've, I've encountered a person that communicates this way before. Okay, I have now established what that person is about, and I will put them over in this little box so I don't have to think too much about it. And I think we really do each other, do ourselves and each other disservice by by doing, I mean, but it's human nature, right? We have to make certain certain shortcuts just to just to um you know it's like your autonomous nervous system if you had to think about every breath you take and every heartbeat you wouldn't get much else done and so we we try and move these things into the background so it's not not in our active thought process but i think that ends up hurting us especially in terms of in human interaction and because it takes time to to build that empathy and learn about People. And one of the things that has been really helpful for me starting to do interviews um, for one of our shows at Bank List Dow is listening to all the uh, the ways people came into this space, why they're here, what's been rewarding for them, what's been challenging, and then 
hearing and getting a sense for some of the common threads has been really fascinating. And I don't have a lot of stories to tell you yet or things to to comment on as through lines um, beyond the things we typically talk about. Um, but it just goes to show you, I mean, the more people you talk to, that we're all figuring it out. <laughs> None of us really knows what we're doing, quite honestly. This is new. And that's also what makes it exciting and it's okay to break things and make mistakes because none of us really knows the right way yet and there may be multiple right ways to do things and to me that's actually pretty exciting there aren't established ways of doing things i always hated going to meetings saying oh well, we can't do that because this didn't work the last time well maybe we should do it differently this time <laughs> and there is no last time so it's it's all new uh, gives a lot more to me it gives you gives, it's a lot more um, engaging that way because you you can pick and choose Um, I always, I can't help it. I just had something happen and I don't, by the way, I don't mean to talk over anybody. So if someone wants to jump up or has a comment to make, I, I don't let me I'm, I'm stop you. Um, but, uh, I don't know how, how prevalent homeowners associations are around the world, but, but there's a lot of them in the U S and I, 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 I always try to, I, I, I shouldn't say always, but frequently think back to the way these small neighborhood organizations have trouble making decisions. I mean, it could be a group of 20 neighbors on a block or, or whatever. And if you can't get 20 people, 20 households to agree on something that is a benefit to the entire neighborhood, I don't know how we can solve these other coordination problems. And so I look at that situation, I go, okay, how can a homeowners association use these new tools or these new ways of communicating to come to better agreement, better understanding? How can they do that? I mean, to me, if we can solve it at that yeah. very micro level, we can solve the big problem. Because this is why I, I'm, I can, I tend to be pessimistic in, in some sense about humanity is because of this, this very real example of people who actually see each other and share a property line who cannot get along. Well, um, let's, let's flip it, Trost. Let's give it a flip. Um, it's a numbers game and it really comes down to scale, right? The smaller the pool of people that you're working with, the less likely you are to find people that are going to agree. When you open up that pool, say to a global scale, like a lot of our DAOs operate on, it's a numbers game at that point. And it is on the community or the DAO to attract the people that they need to attract into their community to make the decisions that they need to make on a micro scale, such as a physical community, you have what you have. And that is often dictated by financial means and little else. Whereas something international like, uh, or even something, um, something, maybe even something on a country level, like a homeowners association, uh, that's got millions, perhaps billions of people in there. So at that point, it's a matter of casting out the right fishing lines or the right nets to pull the right people in that are going to make the decisions that you need to, to need, uh, make. And if leadership has performed their function well enough, 
the messaging would be articulated in a way that people who aren't going to agree with those decisions aren't even going to show up because they don't believe in what needs to happen. But because we are operating these things on a global scale, they have a plethora more opportunities to actually jump into, right? That's the way that I look at it. So just a, a little quick little flip, put it upside down and it starts making sense. Or maybe I'm just like tripping. <laughs> That's the well, it all sounds good. Uh, it's the it's the implementation. There's no way. That's the that's the sticking point. I think. You know, we talk about smart contracts, and the thing is, you still have to have a dumb contract to articulate what it is you're trying to do in the smart contract. Um, and, and again, it gets back to misunderstanding and miscommunication. And we talked about mission before, mission, vision, values. And if the mission and vision values are too vague, well, it's subject to interpretation, uh, too broad. And, you know, you do want some flexibility interpretation, but if it's too broad an interpretation, then you've got, you don't have enough, you may not have enough alignment. You may be doing things across purposes. Um, yes. Yeah, Definitely. the answer is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. You're right. And I saw in the chat here um, the comment about this is a really good one. And I, I don't know the answer. And this could be a whole other conversation over here at the hour. But it was it was Derby Gold who said. Contributors should be made should be made aware of that human problems can be solved only by humans. And DAO tooling or tech cannot solve human problems that's um, a juicy one i like that that's a juicy one that's that's a i don't know that i'd agree 100 percent with that i get the point and i agree that we sometimes as technocrats we tend to think technology can solve everything but i think tech can help facilitate maybe that's a better it can't solve, but it can help facilitate the solutions. It and this is like some of the regenerative economics we're talking about. If you apply the game mechanics properly to that, and you reward, or you 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 have the game mechanics reflect actual human behavior rather than what we would like human behavior to be. <laughs> uh, I just listened to a really good Tim Ferriss episode this morning, and it was with a, um, a researcher from Stanford. And let me see if I can um, pull this up real quick for the name of the episode. Or Jane McGonigal. Um, she is a researcher at Stanford University in California. I highly recommend this episode. It's, uh, episode number 579 of the Tim Ferriss Show. And no, I am not. Uh, sponsored or anything. I just, I think he has really good guests on. Um, he does run a lot of ads, but um, this was a really good one. The subject was how she predicted COVID in 2010, becoming expert of your own future, cross warfare, the 10 year winter and how to cultivate optimism. Um, it was a pretty long one, but it was, it was two, little over two hours. I uh, highly encourage listening to that. It talks about resiliency, uh, in the face of climate change and rapid change and and things that we can do now uh, so that as change continues to uh, be rapid and unpredictable that if we do thought experiments and and imagine potential different scenarios we will be much more resilient much more resilient to deal with it when it when we are presented with those things really fascinating uh, conversation. I digressed a little bit, but but I think it does talk a bit about um, about how the human mind works, and we are still we still do still have a mammalian reptilian brain of sorts that 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 has the fight or flight response. Um, that's not what they talked about, but it was. Uh, uh, I think it would um, be helpful uh, 
in terms of thinking about resiliency, thinking about how we behave versus how we would like to think we behave. And just the fact that that with climate change, with all of the changes in the world, with the global consciousness being focused really on on one thing for quite some time um, this is a rare opportunity to do, do paradigm to to have a paradigm shift in a lot of ways uh, and we can rather than being pessimistic about the future and hand wringing if we can anticipate some of these different futures and and when these alternatives come up then we are better and armed with the knowledge that can help us go down the right path or help have those conversations that will lead us more in a in a in more optimistic positive direction i know what i'm saying is very general um, <laughs> they got into some they got into some real specifics in it and i haven't really fully digested it yet but well you know you can you can lead a wa horse to water but you can't make it drink and i guess tooling is just trying to make the water easier to drink and hopefully they'll partake but <laughs> right one of um, one of my mentors put it really well. Um, something I, I don't remember it though. I've been trying to remember it. Something about people driving innovation and technology driving progress. Uh, I would have to go through my notes of the convention a couple of years back to find it. Um, but yeah, it was a really good a really good thing on how like it's. People are always freaking out. The robots are going to take our jobs, automation, this, that, the other thing. But what they don't realize is it's always going to take, people are always going to be required. People are, we always, we're always going to need people to design it, to, to code it, to oversee it, to innovate it. Like to maintenance it. <laughs> but until quantum computers are out, yeah. Then we might go Skynet. I hope not. Anyways, we're at the top of the hour. Everybody, I don't want to, um, I, I do want to be respectful of, of everybody's time and I do not want to run over. Uh, quick reminder, uh, Navic and Buzzman, I, I really enjoyed the, the feedback in the chat. In two weeks, we will be having a social, um, a social event around the same topic. We do open up the stage. Uh, I would be happy to see everybody back in two weeks. And we will be inviting people up on the stage to have the conversation with us about empathy and ask questions, share examples. Uh, Drost, it was good to see you again. Of course, you are welcome back in, in a couple weeks, same time, same place, um, two weeks from now. And yeah, thanks everybody. We will have this live on Wednesday for the replay. Thanks everybody. Thanks and thanks for the invite. I uh, hope I uh, hope I added some value. And if uh, if not, well, at least we're we've got some different perspectives. So again, thanks. <laughs> uh, we we could have ranted for another two three hours easy. <laughs> <laughs>